for this video, I'm going to look at some arguments that I've actually heard from interviews and debates and things, talking to so-called pastors and preachers and Christians on the issue of sodomy and why they believe it's okay. And so we're going to look at what they say, and then we're going to refute what they have to say. And I've got about 10 or 11 examples here that I've written down in my notes. This is something I used to teach years ago in classes, and I was going through my notes and said this would make a good video. So number one that I have here, here's the, the pro argument. In fact, let me break this down here. This will be the pro side, pro sodomy, and this will be the real side. Okay, so the, the, the pro argument for sodomy, and then of course the real argument about sodomy that deals with it. So number one, <clears throat> they say, fundamentalists fail to read the scriptures concerning homosexuality within context. The Bible is the word of God through the words of humans speaking in the idioms of their times. It should not be taken literally, therefore. Okay, so times have changed, right? Times changed. Times changed since the Bible was written. And so, you know, what those men wrote about, what they thought, what they believed, uh, that was relevant in their time or in their culture, uh, but it's not for us today. Okay, so that's the pro sodomy argument that they'll make. Now, the real argument or the real way to look at at this objection they have, this argument they have, is the fact that God says that his word doesn't change. Well, first of all, it's not the word of man. It's the word of God. These men were moved by God to write down the word of God. So God pushed the pen through those men. The pen in the man's hand was moved by the spirit of God upon them. So it's the word of God. And I've had even Christians say that when I point out scriptures about the moon has its own light, but we're told it reflects from the sun. And that could that actually can be explained fine uh, alongside of Scripture. But I just point stuff out to them, see what they think about it. They go, well, they were writing it how they would have seen it, right? Oh, so when the Bible says the moon has its own light, that's just a man writing what he observed. It's not actually the Word of God, right? I mean, that's kind of what they're saying, but... If God says the moon has its own light, it has its own light. If it's just a man saying, oh, it looks like the moon has its own light, then that's not authoritative. So you've got to decide, is the Bible God's word or not? Of course, the Bible teaches that it is the word of God. And what do we know about the word of God? We know it will stand, right? It will always, this Bible will always stand. The word of God stands forever. The Bible says of itself uh, about the plants withering away and fading away, but God's word shall stand. It says that heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. Jesus said not one jot or tittle would pass away. So God's word stands forever, right? So the word stands forever, which means it's just as relevant today as when it was written. Okay, so if it, times have changed, well, the word of God stands no matter what time you're dealing with. Present time, historically, in the future, you dealing with prophecy, God's word always stands and, oops, I didn't mean to make that big of a slash, stands and it never changes. Okay? Never changes. God says that he's, he says, I'm the Lord, I change not. God says to himself, he does not change. So his word stands forever and he doesn't change. So the time in which the scriptures that speak badly about sodomy, okay, saying that those scriptures don't apply today is not true within the whole of the Bible. The con They're saying we're ignoring context. Well, they're ignoring the context of the Bible that says God's word always stands and never changes. So that's how I would deal with that first argument. Okay, second argument they have. Second argument, uh, they say an abomination in the Bible is a violation of a certain tradition or ritual, but not something that is absolutely wrong. Eating swine, pigs, was an abomination because of Jewish tradition, 
but eating swine is not absolutely wrong across the board. So they're saying that homosexuality can be wrong in regards to a certain people's customs or rituals in the past, uh, but that doesn't mean it's absolutely wrong for everybody in, in all cultures and all situations, right? That's what they would say. So, um, how should I write this? Uh, the, the, the culture, right? Culture, not humanity, if that makes sense. It may have been wrong in a particular culture or custom, but that doesn't make it wrong for everybody. And the example they use is pigs, right? Eating pigs. So, how would I respond to that? Well, there are scriptures that say that we can eat unclean things, right? Remember the sheep going down? And that was, of course, a picture that um, the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles, right? So you can't consider them unclean anymore. The time the Gentiles was coming in, but God was saying, don't, you know, this stuff is not to be considered unclean anymore, right? We're under grace now. And so we see a change there. But there were even scriptures prior to the, the, the Jewish people, the, the, the nation of Israel, that said that you can eat anything that creepeth, right? And so there are scriptures that have given the okay, right? Uh, uh, how should I say this? Bible gave okay to eating pigs and things like that. So the stuff that was cultural... We see in other parts of the Bible, when we read the whole Bible, that, oh, that's a cultural thing, because in one place God says you can eat anything that creepeth, that, you know, so you could eat pigs, but then we see the Jews specifically being told not to eat those unclean things, so that is something specifically given to the Jews. That's rightly dividing, right? And so you make sure that the Jews' mail goes to the Jews, but that humanity's mail or the world's mail, stuff that's for everybody, comes to all of us, and so you rightly divide that stuff. And the Bible gave it okay for some people to eat pigs. Old Testament, New Testament. But told the Jews specifically not to. Okay, so we see an okay being given to the pigs. However, we never see an okay, right? A stamp of approval from God being given in regards to sodomy. They just assume, since it used to be wrong to eat pigs, but now we can eat pigs. Oh, now we can be gay too. And that is not true. All right, number three. Not true because I don't have any Bible for it. We have Bible that says I can eat a pig if I want. But they don't have any Bible that says you can be a homosexual. All right, number three here. The part of the Bible addressing a man, line with a man, concerns the development of the Jewish nation. The avoidance of procreation is the issue here, not homosexuality. In Genesis 38, 9 and 10, Onan is with a woman, but spills his seed intentionally to the ground. God then slays him. So we see that the sin here is avoiding procreation, right? So avoiding uh, procreation, or I'll, I guess I'll just write that. Procreation, okay? So they say the sin isn't. You know, two men being with each other. That's not the problem. The problem is God's trying to start a nation, and you can't do that without making babies. So he said, don't be gay for now. We don't want you to be gay because then you can't make babies, and we can't uh, procreate and, and boost up the population. So the issue was procreation. didn't have anything to do with same-sex attraction, same-sex relationships. Okay? So that's what they would say. Number three, or uh, the answer to that, the real way to see this issue, is the fact that Sodom, okay, Sodom, of which sodomy is named, Sodom was before Israel, right? Sodom came before Israel. So it's not like God said, okay, I'm going to be against Israel. Sodomy against homosexuality because I'm trying to establish the population of Israel. I'm trying to, to build up a nation, and so I need you to make babies, and you can't do that man with man, woman with woman, right? It's got to be man and woman to make babies. So I'm going to make a new rule just for you guys so that you'll make babies, right? 
of out, outside of Israel, I don't have a problem with homosexuality. Well, that's obviously not true because Sodom wasn't a part of Israel. Sodom's outside of Israel, and God judged them for their homosexuality, their homosexual acts, wanting to beat down the door to be with those angels. God judged them for that. And so this idea that, oh, that only applied to Israel because they needed to, to make a nation, therefore they needed to have a lot of babies, that's a ridiculous idea. Because outside of Israel, we see God judging this activity. So we know that that argument for sodomy is invalid. Okay, number four here, and I may not cover all the things in my notes, but I want to at least get a few of these dealt with. Um, they would say, in Exodus 21.7, we see that slavery is condoned. Okay, so there's a stamp of approval on a form of slavery, and I've talked in other videos, I believe, about biblical slavery versus other types of slavery and things like that. But anyway, they said Exodus 21.7 is okay with slavery, so should we follow that too and have slaves today? And then they use that as an example, say, times have changed, kind of like the first thing we dealt with. Things have changed since then, and just because it's in the Bible, that doesn't mean we have to follow it today, right? So, once again, they're talking about how the times have changed. Things have changed, and, uh, you know, we don't have slaves anymore like they have in the Bible. And so, just like we disregard the stuff about the slaves, we can uh, disregard the stuff about homosexuality, right? That's what they're trying to say. Well... Uh, Jesus said in John 12, 48, okay, John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So, you're judged by Jesus' word, he says, and that if you reject him and receive not his words, there's going to be judgment. So you have that in addition to Jesus' words over in Mark. Mark 10, 6 through 9. Mark 10, 6 through 9, which says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh so then they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god hath joined together let no man put asunder so times have changed the slavery issue and stuff well jesus said my word if you reject me and my word you'll be judged and his words say that marriage is a man and a woman no other combination and that's valid for any follower of Jesus Christ, right? What he said. So that's how I would respond to that one. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Roman, or number five. I've got to switch pages. They would say, they address Romans 126. And I'm going to read, I didn't have that written in my notes just what they have to say about it, but let me read the verse first. Romans 1.26 says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, verse 27, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. So in regards to that, they'll say that natural and unnatural here means customary and uncustomary. It deals with pagan versus Jewish custom. It is not referencing long-term monogamous relations of people in the same gender. Okay, so it's talking about pagan... Versus Jewish. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about a, something that's 
sinful or unsinful, uh, or sinful and right, it's talking about customary to the Jews and uncustomary, Jewish and pagan. That's all. It's just saying, you know, what was customary in one culture versus another culture. We're dealing with two different cultures here. Not sin and not sin, just two different kinds of culture. That's all. It's no big deal. That's what they say it's talking about. Well, uh, Romans is written to people dwelling in Rome, right? In Romans 1-7, Romans 1-7, okay, in the beginning of the book, Paul says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Romans is written to anybody that's in Rome. He says, called to be saints. It's not written to the Jews. It's not written to the pagans. It's not written to the Gentiles. It's written to all there called to be saints. So there could be Jews there and Gentiles and uh, Samaritans, all kinds of people. So he's not separating Jewish from pagan and dealing with two different cultures there. He's writing to everybody. They're trying to say that uh, Romans is, is written to one group of people about another group of people, and that's not the case. Uh, so that argument doesn't hold up, okay? It's applicable to everybody when it says that it's wrong for men to be with men and women to be with women. That applies across the board, okay? Uh, number, uh, let's see, number six. Actually, some of these all kind of roll into the same thing. So I'll just put number six. And they say, the sin is not homosexuality, the sin is homophobia. Hatred and fear of homosexuals is not characteristic of Christianity. Love and welcoming acceptance are characteristic of Christ. Um, and then let's see, number eight, and I'll just leave it with number six. It says, all loving relationships are honored by God. This includes homosexuals in committed loving relationships. The theme of the Bible is love, and God's world is always inclusive, never exclusive. Number nine, the ultimate commandment is love thy neighbor and no law should ever get in the way of that. I'm going to tie that in with number six here. Uh, number 10, the church's homophobia makes gays more likely to commit suicide because they feel at odds with God for being who they are. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll actually deal with that one separately. So number six is basically saying this. God... Jesus is love. So we should just love them. Having a problem with homosexuality means that you're not loving the homosexuals. You're supposed to have love like God does for everything and everybody, right? Just be accepting and welcoming. Well, first of all, we do have church discipline, okay? There is church discipline in the Bible, and so we don't have to accept everything. We don't have to be welcoming and accepting of everything under the sun. There's church discipline in the Bible for a reason. If something's wrong, it's wicked, it's ungodly, whatever, that can be judged in the church, and people can be put out for something that is wrong, for living a wicked lifestyle. But also, we have Psalm 5, 5. Right, Psalms 5 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. So we see that the God of the Bible is not all love. The God of the Bible also has hatred for people who commit iniquity. And so there is hatred by God. So we see church discipline. That means we don't have to love and accept everything that comes our way in this world. And we see that God doesn't accept and love everybody, He has hatred towards certain individuals. So this argument that God and Jesus and Christianity are all about love and acceptance, totally unbiblical, totally wrong, because we have church discipline and we have God's hatred both found within our King James Bibles. Now, number 10 on my list, which will be number 7 here, um, the church's homophobia makes gays more likely to commit suicide because they feel at odds with God for being who they are. This makes them hate themselves and their life. Homosexuality cannot be changed by a person's willpower, okay? So that's what they say. Well, so, so by being a, against homosexuality, you are driving them. Let's write that. Drive to suicide. 
inside. Um, I'm running out of room. Not accepted. I'll just write A-C-C-P. Okay, they're not accepted by God. They're driven away from God. And that makes them want to commit suicide. So you shouldn't be against homosexuality. You should be for homosexuality because then people won't be driven to suicide and they won't feel like um, God doesn't accept them. Well, the problem is God can't accept them in that sinful state. You can't hang on to your sin and be right with God. You have to have repentance, okay? You can't get victory over your sin of your own will. That's true. You need Jesus, but that requires a repentant attitude about the sin. So they do have conviction, which is a good thing. They have conviction, and that puts them at odds with God. And telling them that they can keep that sin, right? Ignore the conviction, keep the sin, act like it's all right. That's actually doing more harm than good in the grand scheme of things. It's complicating the issue further because it's telling them that they can hang on to their sin and God will be cool with it. And what it's actually going to do is land them straight in hell. So, I would say that uh, conviction... Conviction is good, and of course, they need repentance. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of small, but they need to repent. We all do. I mean, it's not just homosexuals. Everybody needs to have that repentant attitude to get right with God uh, involving sin. That's why it convicts us, and hopefully, the response to conviction is repentance. The response they want to have to conviction about homosexuality is to be told that they shouldn't feel conviction about it. Ignore the feelings of conviction, and uh, just embrace it. That's who you are, and God loves you as you are, right in your there in your sin, and uh, that's fine. And that might work. I don't think it does. I think deep down, these are this is a very depressed group of people, homosexuals. So um, you're not helping them with that. You're keeping the cure from them. And eventually, if they never get right with God, of course, they wind up in hell at the end. And that's not what any Christian should want for anybody to wind up in hell. So, the conviction they have about being gay, the proper response is to repent, realize it's wrong, and have a repentant attitude. And then, uh, of course, be saved. So, the conviction is a good thing. We don't need to feel bad. So they say oh, it drives them to suicide. Well, yeah, they're not living right with God. They're hanging on to their sin. And so that is going to cause them to be self-destructive. Sin is self-destructive, whether it's alcoholism or pornography or being a homosexual. Sin is a self-destructive thing. And so they need to be convicted about it and get right with God about it. Um, and so that's those are the ten points. Like I said, I wrapped a few of them up into number six here. But those are the ten points that I had in my notes. And hopefully, if you've ever heard any of these, it gives you some answers. Um, if a gay person's watching this, hopefully you realize that uh, the people that are telling you that God's cool with it, Jesus is cool with it, they're doing more harm than good to you. And you need to realize the truth. And, you know, it's... I, I don't teach sinless perfection. Some people have a problem with that. Um, so you can be saved and still struggle with this. But the key is... Do you recognize that it's something wrong that you want to try to get victory over, that you need forgiveness for? You need God to forgive you for being gay. Do you realize that? Or are you fighting against the idea that's getting, oh, no, this is how God made me, and, and it's okay, and, and uh, God and everybody else has to accept me and love me as a gay person. Is that what you think? Because that's wrong. And the truth is you have to accept it as being wrong. Then you can be right with God, and he can help you with that issue. So... Hopefully this has been helpful to people um, that have had questions about this, maybe dealt with some of these objections.